Bona tarda a tothom. Si us sembla, comencem. Han passat just cinc minutets de, de l'hora prevista i com que ja la sala està bastant plena, comencem. Ara ja no, no, no esperem a ningú més, per dir-ho així. Voldria donar-vos la benvinguda a aquesta nova sessió del cicle de debats d'educació, que com ja sabeu, és una iniciativa conjunta de la, de la UOC i de la Fundació Jaume Ufill, amb la col·laboració valuosíssima del MACBA, que ens accedeix a aquesta magnífica sala i que, a més a més, fa possible la gravació dels debats i, per tant, que els pugueu tornar a veure en el, en el web de la, del projecte, que és aquest web d'aquí. Per aquelles persones que és la primera vegada que veniu, només recordar-vos una miqueta quins són, o assenyalar-vos quins són una mica els objectius dels debats d'educació. De, Els debats d'educació eh, tenen la voluntat de promoure un debat, un fòrum, diguem-ne, de discussió obert a la societat en general i a la comunitat educativa en particular, entès en un sentit ampli, al voltant dels temes claus o crítics sobre el futur de l'educació. I per, amb, aquest, amb aquest objectiu, diguem-ne, des del 2003, hem portat aproximadament una trentena de ponents... <coughs> Perdoneu... Se m'ha assecat la gola. Una trentena de ponents eh, amb l'objectiu, com us dic, de, per una banda, obrir nous temes de debat, repensar vells temes, eh, portar, aportar visions externes al món educatiu i també discutir al voltant de recerques o d'iniciatives que s'estan produint en altres països. I aquest equilibri, diguem entre la teoria i la gestió educativa entre la dimensió internacional i la, i, la, i la dimensió pròpiament de la realitat catalana és una mica un equilibri que hem intentat mantenir al llarg d'aquests debats que, com us dic, fa ja doncs, 7 o 8 anys que, que impulsem. Abans de donar pas a la conferència d'avui que ens presentarà Josep Maria Momino, només us volia recordar eh, quines són les, les ponències que hem tingut aquest, aquest any. De fet, aquesta és la primera conferència del curs 2010-2011 o si us estimeu més, diguem-ne, la darrera del, del, de l'any 2010. Pels que heu vingut al llarg de tot el cicle, recordareu que vam començar amb el François Dubet debatent al voltant de la, del declivi de la institució... Teniu aquí, de fet? El declivi de la institució escolar i com això, aquest, aquest declivi de la institució, que no de la funció educativa, de la institució escolar i de les contradiccions en el si del sistema, el que feia era redoblar l'exigència de la capacitat educativa que tenia l'escola. Després vam comptar amb els Jab Drunkers, que el que va fer va ser explorar algunes de les hipòtesis explicatives sobre el, la, la desigual, el desigual rendiment acadèmic de l'alumnat estranger en els diferents països de la, de la OCDE. Vam passar després a parlar, convidar el Ferran Ferrer, el Ramon Plandiura i el Ramon Ferrer a debatre al voltant de quines haurien de ser les prioritats que cal definir en el marc del, des, del desplegament de la, de la LEC, de la Llei d'Educació de Catalunya, i finalment vam, no, perdó, vam convidar el Daniel Inerari també, que ens va, ens va parlar de la, de la importància de la creativitat com a habilitat o com a aspecte clau en, educatiu en el context de la societat del coneixement i de, en un context d'incertesa. I al juny, just abans de les vacances d'estiu, vam convidar la Roser Salabert a parlar-nos de les reformes educatives que s'havien impulsat a la ciutat de Nova York amb l'objectiu d'aconseguir l'excel·lència educativa per a tothom. Avui, com us dic, és la darrera eh, conferència del 2010 i tot seguit us les presentarà el Josep Maria. Molt bé. Moltes gràcies, Mònica. Um, bé, efectivament, és la darrera, el darrer debat del 2010. El primer... De, del curs acadèmic diguem-ne que encetem eh, que jo no voldria estar-me per començar de dir-vos que per els estudis de psicologia i ciències de l'educació eh, aquest és un curs eh, especial en què celebrem el nostre 15è aniversari al setembre del 95 vam iniciar la nostra trajectòria coincidint amb l'inici del primer curs acadèmic de la Universitat Oberta de Catalunya i eh, bé, en el marc de la nostra activitat d'aquest any estem especialment contents d'haver coincidit amb la Fundació en Jaume Bufill en l'impuls dels debats d'educació, una iniciativa que, com bé diu doncs, la Mònica, des de la seva posada en marxa l'any 2003, jo crec que, doncs, que s'ha consolidat com un fòrum de discussió eh, amb rigor de, des de la mirada d'experts del nostre context més proper i també eh, buscant, com en el cas d'avui, el contrast de la perspectiva que podem obtenir de l'àmbit internacional per l'anàlisi de les qüestions crítiques que ha d'abordar el nostre sistema educatiu. La d'avui és, sens dubte, una d'aquestes qüestions 
i tenim el privilegi de poder-la veure des de la perspectiva del nostre convidat, el professor emèrit del Departament d'Educació de la Universitat de Stanford, Larry Cuban. A Catalunya, com la majoria de vosaltres sabeu, des dels anys 80 fins a l'actualitat, amb el projecte, potser més recent, amb el projecte Educat o Perú, s'han impulsat iniciatives per la incorporació de les TIC al nostre sistema educatiu. L'objectiu ha estat promoure l'adaptació de la pràctica pedagògica que es desenvolupa en els centres educatius, de manera que siguin capaços de proporcionar als nens i als joves les competències que els calen per encarar els reptes d'una societat que avui es fonamenta en xarxes d'informació i en una nova economia en què la gestió i la generació de coneixement s'ha convertit en la forma més rellevant de treball. Tot i que crec que ja sabem que les TIC ja no es poden veure com un problema afegit a la llarga llista de problemes que tenen els nostres centres educatius, sinó que segurament s'ha de veure com un aliat imprescindible en aquest procés, l'educació a Catalunya, malgrat els canvis normatius d'aquest període i els avenços innegables en l'escolarització, segurament no ha aconseguit encara suficientment la reformulació necessària en termes pedagògics i organitzatius capaç de respondre als desafiaments que ens planteja la nostra societat, tant en l'àmbit local com global. El professor Cuban ens ajudarà a interpretar els reptes que han de plantejar-se les escoles i els sistemes educatius en un sentit ample per una incorporació de les TIC que estigui al servei de la innovació, l'eficàcia i que doni resposta als reptes que ens planteja una societat com la nostra. I ho farà des de la perspectiva privilegiada que li proporciona la seva ja dilatada trajectòria de recerca sobre aquest procés, fent èmfasi a partir de l'anàlisi del cas dels Estats Units en quins són els principals desafiaments, quins els obstacles, quins els elements facilitadors. El professor Cuban ha desenvolupat la seva activitat docent en l'àmbit de la metodologia de l'ensenyament de les ciències socials, la història de la reforma escolar, el currículum, la instrucció i el lideratge. Ha obtingut en set ocasions el Premi d'Excel·lència com a professor de la seva universitat i creiem que a la llum d'aquesta trajectòria és especialment valuosa la visió que ens pot aportar sobre això que diu malament aquest títol i que hem de corregir sobre el que seria el títol d'aquesta conferència, que és Dilemes polítics i docents de l'ús de les TIC a l'aula, el cas dels Estats Units. Professor Cuban, thank you very much for accepting our invitation and for traveling so far to participate on this debate. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Joseph, and thank you, Monica. I thank the Open University and the Foundation for making it possible to be here. This is my first visit to uh, Barcelona, and uh, it's, it's a great honor for me to be here. I have encountered two puzzling facts in doing research for the last quarter century on school and classroom use of new technologies in the United States. Since the early 1980s, the federal government and states, not to mention philanthropists, have invested billions of dollars in wiring schools, buying and deploying machines, and preparing teachers and students to use high-tech devices. Nearly all teachers now have access to one or more computers at school. As for the number of students per computer across the United States, the ratio has gone from 125 students per computer in 1983 to four per computer in 2006. Access to computers at school for both teachers and students has increased dramatically in the past decade with thousands of schools issuing computers to each and every student and teacher. So here is the first puzzling fact. According to many researchers, there has been little reliable and valid evidence that sustained investments in computers 
have yielded substantial returns in teachers altering their basic practices or producing gains in student achievement. Ensuring access to new technologies then has not led to shifts in teaching practices or increases in students' academic achievement. That's puzzling after all these investments. And this brings me to my second puzzling fact. Studies show that nearly all US teachers have home computers. They use these computers for personal and business reasons. The evidence is clear that these teachers are engaged and committed to using these machines for schoolwork. Teachers use their home computers to locate websites for particular lessons they will be teaching. They locate videos to use. They find other teachers' lessons to see how they taught the content that they will be teaching. And of course, they send email. So here is that puzzling fact. Teachers use their home computers far more than they use their computers in classroom instruction. Now, while you may question these puzzling statements for purposes of this debate, assume that they, what I've said is accurate. Just assume it. How would you explain them, those two puzzling facts, that with all this investment, there's so little return in student achievement? And the second one, the teachers use home computers a great deal, far more than they use them for class, their classroom instruction. So think about it for a second. I will pause and you try to come up with some explanations in your head or jot them down or whatever you want before I'm gonna offer my explanation for it. So I'll pause for a moment. <clears throat> That's a moment. <laughs> <laughs> to make sense of these puzzling facts for me, knowing the history of schooling in the United States and previous attempts at reform helps considerably. How does a past help? These puzzles and perennial dilemmas that accompany the adoption and implementation of ICT are anchored in previous decisions that created the DNA of schooling. This DNA, or genetic code, of U.S. schooling goes back to the origins of tax-supported public schools compelling children and youth to go to school. The DNA goes back to the competing goals of schooling and the establishment of the age-graded school, kindergarten through each grade to the 12th grade. Historians, then, can increase our understanding of the DNA by describing and analyzing previous and current efforts to alter school goals, structures, and practices. So let me spend a few minutes on what historians do and the frameworks that they use to make sense of past events. Historians of education interpret the past. The key word is interpret, since few historians believe that facts ever speak for themselves. Using frameworks that they have built brick by brick from their experiences, scholarly work, and reflection, historians sift facts and create a coherent, credible story. Most historians have a big picture in their heads, one that remains open to change as facts and personal experiences accumulate. Since I am a historian of U.S. schooling who has spent many years as a teacher, an administrator, I too have a big picture in my head of school reform. The bricks that I have assembled into a framework for interpreting U.S. school reform past and present grows from my work as a practitioner and researcher. From both direct experience in schools and research studies, I have come to see that classrooms, schools, and districts as political, socioeconomic, and organizational entities shaping how teachers teach and how students learn. 
I offer the following bricks, one by one, that I have assembled into my big picture that has helped me understand the puzzles and chronic dilemmas that inexorably rise from the practice of school reform. Mind you, this is my big picture. You may have a different one in your head. So, I will not read this to you. You can read it for yourself. Policy elites, and that by policy elites, I don't mean that in a Marxian or any other frame other than to say that these are people who have through, have attained positions in society, uh, in education, in, uh, in the government, uh, in media, and other places where they, <clears throat> where they work through media to identify national and social problems. <clears throat> Solutions to these problems, such as laws, policy mandates, end up being called reforms. Let me give you some examples from the United States. During the 1890s, over a century ago, political corruption, big city slums, and immigration led to the progressive movement, as it was called then, and many government and social welfare reforms. In the... <coughs> Uh, in the 1950s and 1960s, we're jumping ahead, so racially segregated schools, parks, hospitals, housing, and restaurants led to a growing civil rights movement that slowly brought an end to the discriminatory practices and laws in the American South. And since the 1970s, uh, there has been a popular movement in the United States that grows from the fear on the part of these policy elites of losing ground to foreign competitors and the attempt to increase U.S. market strength globally. Now here is the key connection to education. In the U.S., historically, big problems have become educationalized Consider that those early 20th century progressives wanted to rid the cities of slums, ease the difficulties of massive immigration, and end political corruption. Those educational progressives a century ago pulled schools out of city government. They expanded the school's role to include feeding children, building playgrounds for students to exercise, providing doctors and nurses to keep children healthy, and yes, to Americanize the immigrants. For the business-driven reform since the late 1970s and what is going on now in the U.S., to, to, uh, this effort to make the U.S. more globally competitive, reformers then and now lean heavily upon the human capital argument in embracing higher academic standards, more testing, rigorous accountability, and new technologies aimed at producing skilled graduates who in turn, they believe, would spur economic growth. And that's what I mean by the educationalizing of national problems. The uh, uh, people in government people in very influential positions will turn to the schools for a part of the solution to those problems. Now, let me tell you what I mean by the basic structures that I refer to in this part of my big picture. The basic structures is the governance, funding, and organization of U.S. schools. That's what I mean by the DNA or the genetic code. The U.S. has decentralized governance and funding. And what I mean by that, there are over 15,000 school districts in the United States with over 100,000 schools. 
they all receive local, state, and federal dollars. The U.S. has multiple goals for schooling children and youth. That is, in the United States, people expect schools to, uh, to have children literate, that they be socialized, that they be prepared for work, and that their moral character be strong. The U.S. has adopted age-graded schools as a basic organizational unit. These are the fundamental structures, the decentralized system of governance and funding, these multiple goals, and the, uh, the age-graded school. Now, as influential as all these uh, patterns and context and basic structures of schooling are, because they surely influence uh, what goes on in schools, I'm saying that they do not determine classroom teaching and learning. There's a big difference between influencing something and determining it. Equipped with various amounts of experience, content, knowledge, and skills, teachers enter classrooms housed in age-graded schools located in a thoroughly decentralized system of education. Each teacher faces two dozen or more students with a vast array of interests, home experiences, and talents. In schools and districts that are differentiated across the United States by income, and social class, by race and ethnicity, and by historical conditions. Policymakers, parents, and taxpayers expect these teacher students to meet required curriculum standards and do well on tests. They expect teachers to prepare these students for higher education, strengthen their moral character, and cultivate independent thinking while also laying the groundwork for future community participation. Furthermore, parents expect that 12 years of schooling will give their children an edge in gaining success after leaving high school. These social beliefs and external con context add up to an institution filled with competing demands from parents and taxpayers to offer equal opportunity to all children, but ensure that some children do better than others in the race for educational credentials. The job of the school then is to transfer from adults to children the values, knowledge, and skills of one generation to another to prepare them for a future that doesn't stand still while sorting out those children who achieve from those who do not. Schools then are structured, merit-driven, conservative institutions in a market-based democratic society. Teachers, like social workers, police officers, and salaried doctors, have a zone of discretion that no supervisor, no principal, no superintendent, and certainly no lawmaker can manipulate once the teacher closes her classroom door. When that door is closed, teachers become policy makers in deciding what lesson to teach, what low-tech and high-tech tools to use, what questions to ask, and what activities to engage in. It is that autonomy, yes, circumscribed as it is by historical patterns, structures, context, and policies, that make it possible for many teachers to inspire, lead, and teach lessons that extend beyond the classroom and school. Stories of individual teachers and principals who inspire and lead students to achieve even beyond parental expectations have occurred in every generation since the founding of public tax-supported schools 
two centuries ago in the United States. Here then is my big picture framework that I use when examining school reforms past and present. Of course, historians are not the only people who have big pictures or conceptual frameworks in their heads to explain past and current conditions and reforms. Policymakers, parents, researchers, teachers, and administrators, and you here, also have big pictures in your heads. These conceptual frameworks help us figure out how context, structures, and individuals influence what happens in schools and classrooms. These frameworks also help each of us make sense of some of the puzzles and dilemmas involved in using high-tech machines in schools and classrooms. Let me turn now to those puzzling facts that I described a few moments ago. Amid, and I'm gonna repeat them now, Amid unparalleled access to new technologies, there has been little reliable and valid evidence that substantial investments in school-based computers has yielded substantial returns in teachers altering their basic practices or producing gains in student achievement. And the second puzzling fact, computer-engaged and committed teachers use their machines at home far more than in their classroom lessons. I ask you to, uh, to think of some explanations, uh, and now I'm going to use my big picture to explain these two puzzles. You may not agree with them. In fact, I hope you don't agree with them, but at least I'll offer them to you. So why is there so little evidence of frequent use of computers in schools influencing students' academic achievement? because that's one of the reasons that people invest in computers. We want students to do well academically, on tests, and so forth. The answer is that both teaching and learning are too complex and often unpredictable to be captured in the common designs and methodologies that researchers use to determine links between the classroom use of technologies and student achievement. What do I mean when I say the complexity of researching the effects of teaching on student achievement? Consider that teaching students involves many factors relating to who that teacher is, what content and skills are taught, what activities and tasks occur while teaching. Also consider, consider student factors, who they are, what experiences, motivations, and interests they bring to the classroom, and what they do during the lessons. Then consider the school itself, its organization, culture, and its neighborhood. Finally, district factors, its resources, leadership, and the culture of learning or non-learning that it cultivates. All of these factors of the teacher, the student, the school, the surrounding neighborhood and school district affect what goes on in the classroom. Yet, take a look at the majority of research designs and methods used to determine the effects of teachers, uh, of teachers on students. Most common are surveys of teachers and students supplemented by descriptions of practices and interviews with teachers and students. Also common designs are comparison studies of classes studying a topic using computers and classes studying the same topic without computers. To determine achievement in these kinds of comparison studies, students are administered a pretest before and a post-test afterwards. Short of establishing an, an experimental and, and control groups with students and teachers randomly assigned to each group, it is nearly impossible to establish a causal linkage between the use of computers and student achievement. Such experimental or quasi-experimental designs are uncommon and usually expensive. Because surveys and comparison studies are less expensive in dollars and labor, thousands of studies have been done since the introduction of desktop computers in schools 
particularly since the early 1980s. Many show tiny gains in test scores from student use of computers, or more often they show no significant difference. These results, however, at best are correlations, associations between the presence of computers and little gains in test scores. They are not evidence that use of the machines caused a rise in test scores. I will go into this in more detail at the research seminar tomorrow. Still puzzling is why the introduction of powerful electronic machines has led to so little effect on transforming traditional teaching into student-centered teaching. One answer, of course, is that not enough US teachers and students have had access to machines. Such an explanation, to me, is unpersuasive. These devices have increased steadily in US schools to a current ratio of less than four students per computer. Moreover, at thousands of one-to-one -one laptop schools across the US, each student has access to at least one device. And many of the comparison studies have been done in classrooms where students had individual computers. So delete that explanation. Another explanation, one that comes from my big picture framework, is that the external and local context of schoolings help shape the long-term stability of teacher-centered instruction in classrooms. Consider the competing goals that parents, taxpayers, and educators want schools to achieve. While parents want schools to socialize their children to play fair, not hit people, and share, they also want schools to prepare their sons and daughters to go to college, participate in civic activities, ask questions, think independently, strengthen moral character, and be creative. None of these goals, however, can children and youth learn from even the most innovative software and hardware. If students achieve these goals, they have learned from teachers, peers, parents, and others, not software games or high-tech lessons. Moreover, current prevailing fears about the US economy and jobs have produced top, strong top-down pressures upon principals and teachers to meet academic standards and frequently test students. Thus, principals and teachers are expected to ensure that students become proficient in reading and math as measured by tests. And if not, they will be shamed publicly through federal and state accountability rules. Entire schools concentrate their attention on daily lessons to meet these expectations from the government. Furthermore, the age-graded school, with its structured time schedule and teachers assigned to separate classrooms parceling out bits of the curriculum encourages teacher isolation, not staff collaboration. All of these policy mandates, all of these structures, strengthen traditional teacher-centered forms of instruction. Yet even with this contextual explanation, over the past decade, substantial numbers of teachers have come to use these machines frequently. After nearly 30 years of access to school computers in the United States, based on national surveys and research studies, I estimate about 40% of teachers are regular users. By regular use, that, I, that is, I mean computers being used at least once or more times during a week. These teachers, however, use interactive whiteboards, laptops, and handheld devices to fortify teacher-centered instruction. Students are doing internet searches. They're turning in typed rather than handwritten homework. They take notes on lectures. All of these activities capture many of the traditional uses of high-tech machines. There is a small subset of these 40% of teachers, however, 
who do use electronic devices in far more creative and imaginative ways inside and outside classrooms with their students. <clears throat> but mostly that's what I see the 40% of teachers who are the regular users. But the fact remains that the majority of US teachers, most of whom are often on their computers a few hours nightly, are either occasional users or non-users in their classroom lessons. They do not use computers regularly for instruction because they believe that the available software and abundance of machines still cannot teach what has to be taught to students. I pointed out earlier that once teachers close their door, they have discretion in how and what they teach. The estimated 40% who are regular users and the 60% who are not speak to that discretionary authority teachers have in deciding whether or not to use these powerful electronic devices. That the majority of teachers are occasional or non-users is further evidence that the context within which teachers work matter a great deal. They help explain the paradoxes of limited evidence of effectiveness of computers upon teacher methods and teachers using computers at home far more than for classroom lessons. Such puzzling facts and the big picture, picture perspective I offer challenge common beliefs held by many reformers that most principals and teachers resist new technologies, or that they are unskilled or uninterested in high-tech devices. U.S. teachers are neither resistant, unskilled, nor uninterested. They are committed, engaged, and regular computer users at home. Such facts throw doubt upon the common strategies used by policymakers to shame and blame teachers for not integrating computers into daily lessons or shifting to more student-centered forms of instruction. Now, what's the connection between these two puzzling facts, my explanation for these puzzles, and the perennial dilemmas of implementing ICT in schools? Of the many dilemmas facing practitioners that researchers have identified over the past 30 years of computers in schools in the US, I want to focus on one. Uh, the constant dilemma facing teachers in managing the classroom when students use computers. Within age-graded schools, whether they are high schools or elementary schools, whether schools are in neighborhoods where wealthy, middle class, or poor families send their children, two imperatives face all teachers. Know your subject, I call that the academic role. Know your students, the emotional role. Teachers value both academic and emotional roles. Yet, yet, these two roles, academic and emotional, prized highly by teachers, place huge contradictory demands upon them. The academic re uh, role requires teachers to maintain a certain distance from students while transmitting knowledge and skills, while the emotional role asks teachers to get close to students. And that is the dilemma. In the academic role, teaching first graders to read, teaching algebra, teaching biology, teachers must convey knowledge and cultivate skills of students. Then they have to judge the degree to which students achieve mastery of each. Evaluating achievement in the classroom of each student requires evidence of individual performance and social distance for the teacher in treating all students the same in judging how well or how poorly they perform. Emotion is not supposed to sway teachers judging 
student performance. But U.S. teachers are also expected to get close to their students. Professors, mentors, principals urge teachers to know their students as individuals, their background, their interests, their shortcomings, their strengths. Why? Because that personal knowledge will help the teacher draw students into learning what the teacher has to teach. In displaying sincere interest, bonds of affection grow between teachers and students. The emotional ties between a teacher and her students then become the foundation for learning. Balancing these competing roles and the values they represent, however, is very hard to do. Many teachers only embrace the academic role. They say to themselves, my job is to teach science. My job is not to be a friend to my students. Other teachers clasp the emotional role to their heart, wanting so much to be friends with students that they whisper to themselves, like me and you will like what I teach. Finding the right mix is difficult for all teachers. Now enter the computer. In having four to five machines in a classroom or taking a class to a computer lab or having a mobile cart with enough laptops for each student, questions about authority, control, and wasted time enter teachers' calculations. Teachers have worked out in their heads the academic and emotional roles they are required to perform, and now these machines are present in the classroom. What are they to do with these devices and still perform the roles that they are accustomed to? Consider the issues that arise when computers are in a classroom. With a few machines in a classroom, the teacher can divide the class into groups, but must be aware of possible discipline problems, that is, rising levels of noise that disturb other students, since the teacher can only be with one group at a time. Or consider that within 45 to 50 minutes of scheduled time for instruction, much in-class time is taken in booting up the computers, responding to student questions on the software or websites, and ensuring that the assigned task on the computer can be completed before the period ends, since time has to be allotted for printing out student work or sending it to the teacher's mailbox and shutting down the program. Going to a computer lab elsewhere in the school or having a mobile cart rolled into the room also eats up precious instructional time. Another issue, one universal standard of judging teacher competence is control of the students. To many teachers, maintaining a climate of learning often means a minimum of noise arising in a class. With students working on computers in small groups, <clears throat> and interactions among students, noise levels run high in sharing ideas, asking and answering questions, and simply helping one another. Teachers consider that inevitable noise as a risk when being evaluated by a principal who expects a classroom to have minimal noise or who may not share the teacher's enthusiasm for using computers. And even another issue. Teachers enjoy the authority of knowledge, yet students have far more access to information on computers than can come from the teacher. Moreover, teachers can hardly master all the information students have access to through the internet. Such available information, to some teachers, weakens their authority that they have traditionally exercised over what is legitimate knowledge. Now for high-tech enthusiasts among teachers, remember there was that subset among the 40%, these issues about authority and control are far less important 
because they want to transform their classrooms into places where students easily access relevant knowledge and use it. They want student-centered classrooms where the teacher is the guide, the facilitator, not the source of all knowledge and the only authority on what is to be learned. But for many teachers, all of these issues contribute to weakening their classroom authority and eroding their control. For in age-graded schools, the DNA of schooling, its structures, goals, and the academic and emotional roles that teachers must perform, each teacher sits at center stage. Teachers are the ones who know things. They disseminate knowledge, answer questions, make decisions about what goes on in the room, and control the class. They easily perform the academic role, but with the computer moving to center stage, there can be a worrisome shift in authority. Not all teachers worry about their authority being diluted, but many new and inexperienced teachers do. Here then is the dilemma. Nearly all teachers prize the academic and emotional role they are expected to perform. These teachers value the power of interactive software and the ease of these machines to access information. After all, these teachers use their desktops and handheld devices frequently at home, valuing both the roles they are expected to play, the power of these machines to enhance learning, and the workload they already have insofar as curriculum standards and testing, teachers are torn by, these, by the conflict. They have to figure out compromises that ease the conflict and partake of both values. These compromises we see daily in that 40% of teachers who regularly use computers in their classrooms. Students do internet searches, find websites to do uh, papers, type up their homework, write daily journal entries, email their teachers, and even blog on occasion. Then there are the majority of teachers who strike a different compromise over these conflicting roles by being occasional and non-users. These compromises, however, are fluid, not static. They will slowly change as the years pass. More teachers will become occasional and regular users as they learn to finesse these high-tech devices to fit the emotional and academic roles that they have to perform. So the compromises that teachers strike to cope with this dilemma of competing values will not ever solve the dilemma of conflicting roles, but teachers will learn to manage the dilemma as time passes. So I come to the end of my talk. I began with two puzzling statements about teacher use of computers at home and in their classrooms, and the anemic harvest that researchers have found thus far in student achievement and change in classroom teaching practices. I offered different frameworks, including the big pictures that we carry around in our head to explain these puzzles, especially the current 60-40 split in classroom use among teachers that I estimate. I offered you a peek inside my head of the big picture that I use to interpret these puzzling facts and the explanations that I have for the impact of computers on teaching and student learning. My focus is on the external context, the DNA, the genetic code that shapes schools and classrooms. But strong as that DNA is, it does not determine how and what teachers teach. I argue that teachers still have room, constrained as they are, to make decisions and exert their discretion when they close their classroom doors. Then I connected these unsettling puzzles in my explanation to, demands, to the demands that all teachers face when they enter their classrooms. From these competing demands, I extracted one perennial dilemma facing all teachers, figuring out how to reconcile the competing values embedded in the academic and emotional roles that they have to enact in their classrooms. 
Issues of teacher authority and control arise when technological innovations are deployed into schools and classrooms. Conflicting values come into play and teachers have to work out compromises again and again to maintain their priorities around the, rule, the roles that they have to perform. So while I have offered explanations to unravel the puzzles I began with, here at the end of my talk, I have no neat solution to a perennial teacher dilemma. Teachers in, have indeed built classroom compromises that work for a time in managing the conflicting values and roles they perform. But they, neither the 40% or the 60%, will not be able to dissolve those conflicts because they are built into the DNA of schooling. Thank you.